My name is Julie Kaplan, and I'm the Manager of Public Programs at the Center for Jewish History. Welcome to the second program organized by the Center Scholars Working Group, Hear Their Cry, Understanding the Jewish Orphan Experience. This program concludes the group's very productive two years at the Center. The Center for Jewish History is a home for the archival collections of five partner institutions, which together create the largest, most comprehensive archive of the modern Jewish experience outside Israel. Since we have four fascinating lectures to get to, I'll briefly introduce our moderator, Susan Jacobowitz, and she will introduce our speakers. Susan is one of the co-conveners of our Scholars Working Group on Jewish Orphans, along with Amy Traver. And this is the third program this spring in which we've been fortunate to have Susan's participation. She's a professor of English at Queensborough Community College, part of the City University of New York. She recently completed a manuscript about her father, and her second generation identity entitled Far From Childhood, a Holocaust memoir. Before we begin, a couple of technical notes. First, you're welcome to submit questions for the Q&A portion of our program using the Q&A function visible on the bottom of your screen. You can type your questions throughout the program. Note that the chat function has been disabled. Second, the program is being recorded and will be available on the center's website and YouTube channel soon. We will email you the link to the recording as soon as it's available. And now without further ado, I turn this over to Susan. Thank you so much, Julie. I wanna welcome everyone to this event and thank Julie and the Center for Jewish History for the support that my colleague, Amy Traver and I have received over the past two years as we co-directed this scholars working group. Um, the focus is understanding the Jewish orphan experience and we're just so pleased to be able to share some of the scholarship today. So I'm going to introduce all four of the presenters with a short introduction, the longer um, introductions or uh, the, the longer versions of their backgrounds are available um, online uh, as part of the, the description of the event. Um, they're going to follow one another as they present so that we have time for questions at the end. So please do you know, start putting the questions into the, the Q&A whenever you feel ready. Our first presenter is going to be Natalia Alexion. She's a professor of modern Jewish history at Turo College in New York. She's published widely on Polish Jewish issues, including writing Jewish history in Eastern Europe. Emily Bengals is a doctoral candidate at Graz College in Philadelphia. She was a JDC fellow in 2020 and was selected to be part of the USC Shoah Foundation's past is present commemoration of the liberation of Auschwitz. Joshua C. Andy is an upper school history teacher at Winchester Thurston School in Pittsburgh where he specializes in non-US history. His latest publication, When Ghosts Roam the Streets, appeared in February, 2020 in In Context. And Katerina Menchik received an MA in history and literature from the CUNY Graduate Center in 2019. After working in the archives of the Leo Beck Institute in New York, she's currently a research associate at the Arlson Archives International Center on Nazi Persecution. So we're going to turn things over to Natalia. Thank you so much, Susan. And uh, thank you, Julie. Thank you, Center for Jewish History. And I'll just say that we all have 20 minutes, so uh, hardly a lecture. Uh, it's more just giving you a taste of the research that we were fortunate to uh, carry out together and discuss together. Uh, so I will, um, I will speak briefly today on survival strategies of Jewish orphans during the Holocaust in Eastern Europe. And uh, I think that this is the topic that immediately brings up, especially the, uh, the story of Janusz Korczak and uh, Stefania Wilczyńska, his close collaborator and the children from the, um, our home uh, orphanage in the Warsaw Ghetto, uh, but also other uh, institutions uh, for uh, orphans in uh, various ghettos uh, in uh, German-occupied Poland. Uh, there is a study on uh, on an orphanage in a ghetto in Kraków. Uh, there is work on orphanages in uh, Łódź ghetto. Uh, and Sarah Zaro, whom you have here on the list of some of the authors uh, publishing on a topic, is working on Cecilia Klaftenowa in uh, Lviv, Lviv, Lemberg. 
But I want today uh, move away from the institutions as places that were trying eventually unsuccessfully to care for uh, uh, orphans during the Holocaust and talk about individual experience of orphans that were on their own, uh, uh, not in uh, orphanages and that were becoming orphans during the Holocaust and discuss or rather just touch on such issues as age and gender, um, gender, uh, especially in a context of circumcision, uh, which made uh, Jewish uh, uh, boys particularly vulnerable, uh, social background, the whole question of how the moment of losing one's parents uh, is effectively described by uh, survivors as the end of their childhood, whatever terrible experiences they go through before, uh, and the shift from uh, Jewish institutions that traditionally care for orphans that can no longer uh, protect them into increasingly family networks, uh, increasingly extended family networks as parents and close relatives uh, are murdered and into what I call surrogate families, families that emerge in the context of the Holocaust and sometimes become new families uh, after the war. There's also the question of the uh, righteous among the nations, that they play a role in uh, uh, rescue of orphans, but also children's individual agency, how they see their own experience, their own survival. And then, uh, of course, um, back to the institutions uh, that will uh, take care of uh, survivor orphans at the end uh, of, uh, of the war. Uh, now, what, what matters here, of course, is the kinds of narratives we have and who is narrating the experiences of, uh, of orphaned childhood in a Holocaust. Is it the voice of the children, of the caretakers, of relatives, uh, of righteous uh, um, who, um, who help these children temporarily or, or not temporarily? Um, and I will focus today on one particular trajectory, which is hiding, hiding either as passing, uh, passing as a Christian child, or hiding invisibly, being um, uh, below the ground, as it were, uh, uh, in uh, Eastern Europe. But I will focus on Galicia, what is now primarily uh, Western Ukraine, the part of uh, uh, Galicia that came under the German occupation in the summer of 1941. So it was effectively under the German occupation from the summer of 41 to the summer of 44. And I mentioned before that uh, orphans uh, um, and orphanages, th these are uh, crucial institutions of, of Jewish communal life, uh, supported as you can see here in the case of Zhukiev, Zhokva today uh, by JDC, by JDC, joint and the most um, uh, prestigious individuals in the community found those uh, institutions, support those institutions. It's actually the uh, activity of the community perceived as uh, important, prestigious, uh, that involves caring for orphans, uh, making them prepared for a productive, independent life as much as possible. And of course, in the context of the Holocaust, this is no, no longer uh, possible or relevant. And as uh, orphanages uh, are those that are actually targeted during deportations to death camps or to uh, uh, mass shootings, uh, individual children emerge as survivors who then continue trying to survive passing or hiding. And so here is one micro history of uh, uh, Hieronym Meislisch, a boy born in 1934 in uh, um, Lviv, Lviv, who starts off as a, um, the only child in a, in a um, upper middle class family uh, who loses her uh, first his father when uh, his mother and himself leave the ghetto and the father decides to stay in and then his mother commits suicide leaving um, Hieronym 
uh, on his own. But here we have also the role of the extended family. He's in fact cared for by his aunt and her non-Jewish non uh, partner, uh, who is his rescuer. But he also becomes really, while hiding on his own and being visited by, by this uncle and aunt uh, uh, every now and then, he becomes his own independent person. He thinks of himself very much as uh, the only uh, child uh, orphan on uh, making his own decisions. And at the end of the, uh, of the occupation of Lvov, uh, he makes a decision to leave on his own, first deep into Russia, and then checks himself in to a Jewish orphanage in Krakow. Another micro story of that kind of a child that is younger, born in 39, just before the war breaks out, a uh, little uh, Ita Keller, who also becomes an orphan when she first loses her father and then her mother. She's picked up uh, from a hiding place by this man, Tadeusz Kobyłko, who adopts her. Now she lives uh, um, on the above ground as his officially as his uh, daughter. Uh, uh, he gives her her name and presents her as his adopted child. Uh, but she's also cared for by her aunt, who is Kobyłko's um, wife, at least wife during during the war. So here again, she's not uh, she's not left on her own, but she becomes a, a, an orphan. And the situation of uh, orphanhood continues after the war because after the war, she's actually handed over to a Jewish orphanage uh, in uh, Poland. Um, Another uh, scenario uh, in which orphanhood does not end at the end of the war, there is no adoption, uh, there is no incorporation into a family, uh, is the case of Viktor Ratner, uh, another boy from Lvov, who uh, is handed over to an elderly woman uh, taking care of him, and she becomes his adopted grandmother. Here is that uh, surrogate family uh, idea. Uh, she doesn't know he's Jewish, or at least that's what he, giving a testimony right after the war, thinks that she never guessed his real identity. This is a question, given the fact that he's uh, circumcised. But he makes a very conscious decision, which he describes in this post-war testimony, to make her love him. And one of the most dramatic moments that he uh, um, tells his story is when he states with great satisfaction and pride that uh, he made her love him more than her own children and grandchildren. So here was uh, an orphan who made it a point uh, to, to create a situation that allowed his survival by creating an emotional bond. Uh, with his uh, rescuer, uh, who then uh, gives him up at the end of the war, and he also ends up in a, a Jewish orphanage. And another story, which is a variation of this um, daily experience, emotional um, entanglement, uh, agency, and a crucial role still played by grown-ups is a story of a little girl, uh, the one on the right with a bow, uh, who becomes an orphan, uh, but uh, draws attention of the man on the left who had lost his own daughter, uh, the same age, and he becomes invested um, while in the ghetto in Drachobych uh, in assisting little fella. And in the end uh, becomes not only an absolute um, uh, necessary uh, um, traje trajectory for her survival because he takes her to a hiding place that otherwise she would not be able to have, but he also adopts her and makes her his child uh, uh, legally his child after the war. Now, all these stories that involve uh, questions of how children experience the loss, how children experience their own survival, to, to what extent they see themselves um, responsible and capable of making their own survival happen, affects also the way they experience the end of the war when many of them end up back or rather 
now for the first time in uh, in an orphanage they're no longer on their own uh, sort of making their own lives but rather they're cared in an institution that that the kind of institution that had been uh, in operation for Jewish orphans in Eastern Europe before the war and now takes on a very new uh, a very new kind of challenge which are uh, survivor, survival, uh, survivor children. And again, this is a story that would require another uh, 12 minutes. I will stop here and uh, encourage you to look at some of the work uh, published by scholars I mentioned earlier, uh, especially uh, Jana Michlitz and uh, Jana Sliva and several other historians who work on this post-war uh, um, process of adaptation uh, of uh, survivor children into institutional life of orphanage. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. That was beautiful to see the children and imagine their worlds. I'm Emily Bengals, and I'm going to be presenting about the children from Vichy, France, who came to the United States as a, our own kinder transport and how we can learn from those children and those efforts to rescue those children with current migrant children coming to the United States. So first, I'm focusing on Vichy, France, where France used to be considered the free world, and it is again, but for a while, many people from Eastern Europe fled to France. And there were many Jewish immigrants in France. After Kristallnacht, many children fled on their own without their family to France and other places. And in France, they ended up in children's homes. Many of these homes were led by a group called the Ouvre de Secours aux Enfants. I'll call it the Ose. It was a Jewish children's aid organization usually caring for their health. And these children's homes became bastions of freedom and hope for many of the children. It's from these homes that there was a point in 1942 that the United States was likely to take about 5,000 children, but that never happened. And so one of the things that we need to look at is what was successful and what got in the way of the success and how can we use that to help us nowadays with children who need support. So the children's homes, as I said, were beautiful places. They might not have had all the food, but they had hope for future. The children were taught skills so that they would have future careers. They went to school, they learned instruments, they played sports, they built gardens, they learned woodworking. Yes, they were potty trained too. They got there sometimes from kinder transports from Eastern Europe or Germany and Austria. Often that was financed by parents or local organizations, but a large amount of money was sponsored also in advance from the JDC, the Jewish Distribution, Joint Distribution Committee. And they also later on were released from internment camps in Southern France. Here, l'enfant libéré du camp se réveille le lendemain dans une maison osé. The child liberated from the camp wakes up the next morning in an osé home. At that time, it was believed that children should not be in mass internment situations. They should not be in concentration camps. And the Vichy France government agreed with organizations that gathered together and said, we'll take care of the children. Please let them out of the camps. Eventually, though, it was not safe in those camps. They became more than internment camps. They became places where people were gathered to soon be to transported, deported eastward to extermination camps. As people were getting wind of it not staying at all safe in France, a group called the 
United States Committee for the Care of European Children, worked with other organizations to help children leave France. Eleanor Roosevelt was an honorary head of the program. Marshall Field was a director of it. And there were members of this committee from many organizations, including the Quakers, the JDC, the Non-Sectarian Refugee Association, and also the Jewish organizations. They were able to allow children to come into the United States in small numbers but with a mass affidavit. It started with allowing children from England to come, but when England no longer wanted to send its children to safety evacuated in the United States, because it might not have been so safe to bring them on the seas over to the United States, the plot of the US Com, the US Committee, was able to shift towards mainland children. It was not a governmental organization, but it did have the okay and the approval and connections with the United States government. You can see that the children went generally to Marseille, where they gathered, they got their paperwork finalized. They needed their parents' permission to leave or to have no more parents. And then in general, they went through Spain to Lisbon and they could take a ship out of Lisbon. It was a neutral ship, so it would not have the same risks as a ship, say, from England. Sometimes the ships also went through Casablanca. You'll see that there were many children who were approaching 16 or 17 who were in these groups of children who were living in these homes who had the ability to perhaps be rescued, but the United States did not allow kids over 16 with these group affidavit visas, affidavits and visas. And there's heartbreaking footage in so many documentations from the archives of each rescue organization naming children who were 16 and 17 years old considered of majority in France, therefore able to be deported, who were not able to actually leave. That said, organizations did work together. The Unitarians were the first group to bring children over from France. The US Com then took their knowledge and worked with the Quakers, the AFSC, to continue that progress, but the USC continued to share its knowledge and its skill and offices with the friends. They also worked with the medicine and creating kindergartens for these children while they were in camps, internment camps and in homes. The other home, there were other homes that were led by the YMCA and by the Red Cross. They were usually funded in large part, 90% or so, by the JDC. Donald Lowry of the YMCA was the head of a group of about 25 organizations of different faiths that gathered together to try to improve life for everybody in the camps and eventually put forth a big effort to free children from the camps and get the children into the United States. And when the United States was not an option, working to get children into other countries as well. And the American Red Cross also did a fair share of transporting children on the mainland. So seeing how these groups worked together is something that was very important. There were multiple crossings of these children. It was publicized largely in the news. We generally had about 50 kids coming at a time they were not all Jewish, I'm using the word orphans, although some of them still had parents in the internment camps. Most of the parents were eventually deported and killed. But they didn't only want to take the Jewish children because they didn't want it to be seen as just a Jewish effort. There was still a great deal of anti-Semitism in the United States. And there were Spanish children in particular in need 
in these camps due to the leftover results of the Spanish Civil War. You'll see here in July 1942, there were massive, the beginnings of deportations in northern France, later on in southern France. And then you'll see the great tragedy that Operation Torch, when the United States went in to North Africa, starting our entry into the European part of the war, that made the borders close in France. Ironically, Eleanor Roosevelt was involved with this part of the rescue, but she did not even know or claim not to know about Operation Torch. There were children stuck in Marseille who were about to be sent to the to Lisbon, to the United States at that time, and they were returned to the homes. Many of those children eventually did make it into Switzerland. However, there were gaps. You know, those 5,000 children never did make it. It was more like 300 children. There's been critique, especially by Ernst Papenek, who is one of the cheerleaders for these children, a former head of several of the homes who made it to the United States. There were gaps that people didn't feel quite the pressure of time. If we knew that in November the gates would close, perhaps we could have gone faster. There was some pull and push and tug of war of power plays between people in each of the organizations. Views of should children be institutionalized and stay together or should they be separated? Questions about whether it's better to help children in the camps or bring them over to the United States. And then good old personality struggles too. In the end, one of the most toxic situations was publicity. France is a very proud country. Laval was particularly proud. He did not want bad publicity about how the French were treating its people, but at the same time, he didn't want to be seen as making any humanitarian efforts towards Jewish children in particular, because he was going along with the Nazis. Some say that the not, that, that Vichy France sometimes was more Nazi than some of the Nazis and how they treated people. Nowadays, we have a situation with unaccompanied children again. Often we'll call them migrants because there is more of a hope of them returning. Their situation is similar and different. These are the main reasons why the children end up coming here. There have been civil wars in the Northern Triangle countries. There was in fact a genocide that the United States had a part in, in Guatemala in the 1990s, and it's still suffering financial and population consequences from that. There's a lot of gang violence linked with drugs. The average age in Guatemala is 21.7. Compare that to the United States of 38, and then think about the educational opportunities. The United States is hesitant to take people in who are just looking for a better life. But there are life and death situations for some of these children. The violence rates are extremely high, especially towards children, especially towards females. Another difference, though, is that there's no ocean. People can come by land. So people are more likely to come independently. They don't need to worry about ships. And they can come by foot or by train. You'll see on the top of this train, La Bestia, how unsafe that can be. In For the children coming over nowadays, often they're coming up to family already in the United States and there's hiring of smugglers at no small expense. Yes, in France there were passeurs that helped people pass through the mountains. Some of them did charge, but many of them were acting as part of resistance organizations and relief agencies. In France, from France, in the Vichy years, we brought over just 300 children as part of our kinder transport. From 1933 to 1945, the United States brought over, they're called a thousand children. It's probably more like 1400 children. In the year of the famous British kinder transport, we're talking about 10,000 children that were brought over. Right now, there's over 20,000 children on the border at any given time. 
So the numbers, the sheer quantity is different. And because of the ship crossing, the children then came over, usually with paperwork already filled out before they got on the ships. Whereas now for many of the children coming over, it is impossible to get the paperwork in advance because often the governments are working along with the gangs or the unsafe groups and they cannot get the paperwork filed. One final big difference is the parents. The children in the Holocaust were saying goodbye to their parents. They believed that they were gonna be able to bring their parents here, but that was an innocent belief. Most of the parents were deported and killed. Whereas here, sometimes the children come with their parents and then separate just before. Sometimes they used to come and then were separated. We've heard about family separations. Sometimes their parents are already here and they come in advance. So this is more of a family unif reunification. Oddly, before to reach America, children needed to say goodbye to their parents. I spent a lot of time thinking of solutions. A key tenet for me is that nobody wants to leave a safe homeland. If we can help people in their own country, they can stay with their families, they can stay safe. We imported a lot of the gangs to Guatemala. We have some responsibility there. We can't fix it all, but as a large society to help out creating safety. Now we have technology that's a lot better than in the past. We don't have the same telegrams and censorship. We could work on paperwork to help process the children in advance. And there are many organizations that are working for these children, but working to collaborate so the children have a safer journey, a safer welcome, and safer housing once they're there is important. But we need to remember, whether it's 300 children, 20,000 children, or more, whether it's children from France in the Holocaust or the Northern Triangle nowadays, from within the United States or from across the sea, these are children who do need help. And there are people who are working to study them and to help them. Thank you. Thank you, Natalia. Thank you, Emily. So I'm going to be speaking about uh, one particular story, uh, Remember and Resistance, and it's the testimony of Rachel pinchovitz Litvak. Rachel is the mother of a good friend of mine who lives in Pittsburgh, and about 10 years ago, uh, I was given her story, um, and it's a little bit of a background. Um, Rachel survived as a what we would consider an orphan, um, and that's one of the things that our group has been discussing for two years is this, this notion of the definition of orphanhood that we consider um, you know, someone who has lost their parents or has no parents an orphan, but did they actually uh, individually themselves consider themselves an orphan? Uh, and in the Holocaust, there was a lot of different discussions around, around that sort of notion of orphanhood. Uh, to my knowledge thus far in my research, and this is a work in progress that is still ongoing, Rachel never considered herself an orphan. Um, she was 14 when the, the when the war broke out, uh, living in Baranovich, Poland. Um, at the end of the war, she did make her make her way as a refugee to, to um, mandatory Palestine. Um, was fought in the war for independence in Israel as a member of uh, the Israeli police, uh, and then as an educator, uh, raised the raised the family as well. Uh, and only in the 1970s did she begin to talk sort of around her story without actually being very specific. And when one of her own grandchildren uh, was being bar mitzvah, wrote down her testimony uh, in Hebrew, was translated into English, and I'm working on it now to provide historical context and to make it into a, a generational story uh, and, and telling not only Rachel's story, but that of her daughter, uh, Zipora Gore, who um, gave the story to me uh, and how she, her and her family came up, came to know um, what uh, what her mother and her father experienced during the Holocaust and, and Baranovich and as partisans um, fighting in the, the swamps and forests on, and around Novogrudic and, and Baranovich. It is a generational story passed down from, from mother to daughter. Uh, it's a story of one particular um, teenage girl in the Holocaust, but then also how those stories are 
the experience was passed down through this family. I've chosen a few quotes throughout the story to, to, to expand on. Rachel's born in 19, well, her story says she's born in 1923. She actually makes herself older throughout her life, um, both in, in the, during the Holocaust and after. And through some work at the Jewish Historical Institute, I found some documents that actually places her birth at 1925, puts her at 14 in 1939. Uh, she goes into the, into the Bronovich ghetto. She's from a sort of a middle-class family. Her, her mother's family own a printing business in Bronovich and they print postcards, uh, which are actually on the, um, in display in the, in the museum, the Bronovich Museum. Uh, which is, if you've been um, following some of the news in, in Belarus, is uh, the director was actually um, fired by the government about three weeks ago, uh, three or four weeks ago. Uh, and so she did have means. Um, she comes from a well-educated family. Rachel herself went to the Basyakov school. There are two pieces in her story that speak to going to the, the Basyakov school in Krakow itself, but then also perhaps in Baranovich itself, uh, and through the Basyakov project, a digital humanities project, which our group interacted with in one of our meetings, I was able to look at some of the, the documents that they've been able to, to glean from the first sort of 30 or 40 years of, of the history of the schools. And there is substantial letters to, from Baranovich, from the school in Baranovich to Baranovich Jews living in the United States, specifically in New York City, um, and an appeal for funds for the school to keep it going. Uh, her parents, her sister, her brother um, are all uh, are killed in the, the second and third actions, uh, uh, the liquidation of the Bronovich ghetto in 1942 and 1943. This is uh, a quote uh, from the, the end of her story when they're trying to build the, the memorials around, around the town. And this notion of finding out in 1945 what happened to her family once she returned from uh, the forest um, and living in, in huts that were actually erected by her, by her maternal uncle. This is the first moment she realizes that she's alone uh, in 1945 and that she is attempting to find who else is left. She has a brother that, that did leave for, um, for Palestine in the 1930, late 1930s and a sister that left uh, for uh, California in, in the 1930s as well. Um, and in her story, there's no mention of them, uh, only a, a passing of the, the older brother once she does get to Israel after the war. It's, it's what happens next that, that fascinates me with the story and how it's passed down. Um, Rachel and her husband, V get to, get, to the mandatory, get to mandatory Palestine in 1945 or, and 46. They are on uh, the SS Wedgwood, which is one of the last refugee ships that the British let into Haifa, uh, and they built a life in Haifa. Um, growing up, the, the uh, daughter, Zippy, uh, Zippora, named after her uh, maternal uh, grandmother, knows nothing about her family's story, um, knows nothing about uh, her parents really become the sort of good Israelis. They speak Hebrew. Um, they, they, they make a life um, and they forget about back there. They keep talking about back there. We don't talk about back there. And it's only through sort of bits and pieces of fleeting conversations that she can't understand uh, that Zippy learns about her mother's story. First and foremost, that when she's not supposed to understand what's going on, her parents speak in Hebrew or excuse me, speak in Polish or Yiddish at home. Uh, and she can't understand what's being said. Her father has a, has a, has a business in Haifa that deals with a, a German Jew that lives in Munich. Uh, and Munich, his name, invites the family in 1968 to, to come visit and, and spend a holiday in Munich. And Zippy's father, Zvi, will not go, right? He, their friend is a good German, but he will not go to Germany. Uh, and so Rachel says, I will take Zippy and we'll go to Munich. And this is really Zippy's first interaction with the Holocaust and her mother. They come down the flight, the stairs out of the plane when they land in Munich. 
and a West German border guard in a uniform, says passport bitte in sort of gruff German. And her mother freezes, drops her purse, drops her passport, drops all her papers and starts shaking and falls to the ground. And once they, once she collects herself, Zippy asks, what is, what is, are you okay? And she, she makes a, Rachel makes a comment about having a, a flashback of, of the past and how, how those words triggered memories from, from back there. And while they're in Munich for uh, a week or two, any conversation late at night when they think that when they, they think that Zippy is sleeping is in Yiddish and they talk about what was, what had been, but she can't understand um, what they're discussing. And she said growing up that her mother always talked about not having family, um, but we didn't have family members and that our family was, were Holocaust survivors. That anytime there was um, Shabbat dinner, the high holidays, family gatherings, it wasn't, it wasn't family in a sort of traditional sense that it was other survivors from Baranovich, from other towns in Poland, uh, or what had been Poland, Baranovich is now in Belarus, that would come over and acted as if that, that, that was the family. And it wasn't until Zippy moved to Pittsburgh in 1974 and her mother started visiting her that she started to tell a, a, a version of her story. And Rachel would visit the school that, that Zippy was the principal of a community day school, which is a Jewish day school here in Pittsburgh and would tell of, would, would discuss her story with students. Um, it's a, it's a pre-K through eight school. So there were middle school students and she would, Zippy would say she would tell a very sort of um, scheduled, very static version of her story. I, I lived in Baranovich. I fled the ghetto. I survived in the swamps and the forests without much detail. And just asking a few questions over the next 30 years, she started to come to a realization that a lot of the memories were repressed and that throughout her interaction with her mother, that she was attempting to understand something that she could never understand. She didn't know what questions to ask. And only in the last maybe 15 to 20 years realized that the time had passed. Um, her mother's um, is, is moving through, is, Rachel was still alive in an assisted living facility in, in Haifa. Um, is, is no longer uh, mentally capable of answering the questions. And so that those deep memories are, are lost today. And it's my hope that through this work and, and working in different archives uh, as part of, the, as part of our, our working group, that I can gleam a little bit more of, of the story. And through this, through the work in the last two years, I've been able to work in the Yuva archives and work with the Bronfitz Yuxor book and learn a little bit more. Um, one of our last meetings in February of, of 2020, before we um, uh, were sent, <laughs> sent home with, with um, everything shut down with COVID, I was looking through the book and Zippy always knew that she, she believed that her, her grandfather have been on the, the Jewish council. Um, and she never knew, she has, had no, has no pictures of him, um, didn't know what his role was, if at all, if he had been on the council. And we we're able to find pictures of the Jewish council in Baranovich with Moshe Litvak uh, uh, in the council. And he was in charge of food distribution in, in the ghetto. Um, within the Jewish Historical Institute in Warsaw, they have records from all over Poland there are some records from Baranovich. Most of the local records on property, on, fa uh, on, on family records are all still held in Baranovich. And it's, you know, it's, it's difficult to get to, into Belarus right now uh, to look at them. They do have some work. I'm still working with them on 
some of their archives from the Bas Yaakov School in Krakow. Uh, I'm working through Katharina, who's going to speak next after me on the Erlinson archives. One of the things that Rachel speaks to in her story is that when she's in the, when she was in the ghetto with her family, and when the first first and second actions are taking place, and that uh, particularly Jewish men are being rounded up and taken out of the ghetto and taken out of town to somewhere. She speaks to the mass deportations and the, the mass murder of, of Jews, the Holocaust by bullets in Baranovich, but she doesn't know where they're going. Um, she wrote her story about 30 years ago when she, when she actually wrote it down. And she says in the 1940s, we didn't know where our family members, we didn't know where our, our, our neighbors were being taken and murdered. And working through, with Yahad and Hunam and their mapping of, of the Holocaust by bullets, we're able to to put that back into her story, um, to put um, historical footnotes into the work, uh, to say that what we know now uh, are things that um, she couldn't have known then. Uh, and one of the great things about working together as a group and, and the Hear Their Cry working group is um, we've brought in a lot of digital humanities work. Uh, one of those being the Bas Yaakov project out of the University of Toronto, it tells the story and the history of, of the schools, but then also has a repository of um, primary sources that is searchable by, by name, but then also by um, geographic area. And so my, my hope in this project, uh, which is still ongoing, is to bring Rachel's story, uh, which is a very particular story, to a wider audience, but then also make it about how the second generation learns about their family's past and what they do with it. Um, Zippy has made it into her life's mission as an education, uh, both as a, as a Jewish educator uh, and one of the groups that I work with, Classrooms Up Orders, that then Talia and I actually work with in the summer and taking groups of, of teachers to, to Poland and learning about history. Um, so I thank you for your time and I welcome any comments and questions. Thank you very much, Josh, for sharing your research and for this very moving presentation. I will speak today about uh, oral histories um, from interviewees who uh, escaped Austria on the kinder transports uh, that are preserved in the Leo Beck Institute's Austrian Heritage Collection. And my interest uh, in the kinder transports from Austria was actually prompted by an exhibition at the Center for Jewish History in 2018 on the occasion of the 80th anniversary of the first kinder transport to Great Britain. Um, so here you can see the um, uh, photo of, of, of this uh, for, for advertising the exhibition, rescuing children uh, at the brink of war. As most of you probably uh, know, the kinder transports were a rescue operation by which about 10,000 predominantly Jewish children were able to escape Nazi Germany after the November pogroms in 1938. However, they were only able to escape alone without their parents as the visa requirements were only waived for unaccompanied children under the age of 17. And as Emily has already referred to earlier, uh, we know that many, many of these children's, uh, children would never uh, be reunited with their parents again. Most of the children went to Great Britain, uh, but also to other countries, including the Netherlands and Sweden. And out of these 10,000 children that were saved by the kinder transports, approximately 2,300, so almost a fourth, escaped Austria. And after visiting the exhibition, I, as someone who was researching, researching exile and who grew up in Austria, I was wondering about the specifics of the situation of the children who had left Austria. I then noticed that while in the past uh, 20 years, an encompassing body of scholarship about many different aspects of the kinder transport has been published, there are only uh, rather few works that focus explicitly on Austria as a country of departure, and up to today, no comprehensive study on the experiences of the children from Austria has been published. 
at the time I visited the exhibition, I also had just begun to discover the oral histories from the Liu Beck Institute's Austrian Heritage Collection. As of today, this collection holds more than 730 oral history interviews with Jewish emigres who escaped the Nazis from Austria and either immediately then or later in their lives uh, moved to the United States. While most of the interviews are not yet transcribed, um, they are all indexed um, and described with a short biography of the interviewed person and linked to keywords. And like this, um, I could find about 60 te testimonies that were given by interviewees who were on the kinder transport. However, as most of them have not yet been transcribed, I, in this first phase of the project that is still a work in progress, um, started to work with uh, 10 interviews. These interviews have been conducted since 1996 and they are still being conducted up to today with a current break due to the pandemic, but it's planned to continue the project in the future. And the specific setting of the collection is that the interviews are done by young volunteers from Austria who come to work at the Leo Beck Institute for one year at a time and contact. And then if they agree, meet with Holocaust survivors in the United States and record their stories. And so here on this photo, we see um, the most recent volunteers after an interview with Harvey Strum in New Jersey, in his home. And um, I was uh, lucky enough to uh, accompany them to the interview. And then after the interview, take this photo. And so um, we see how we from here sitting in the middle and um, on the wall, there's a portrait of him as a child and more than 80 years lie between this child portrait that was done in Vienna and the day of the interview. Um, so, the design of this collection um, has this very strong focus also on this personal encounter between the interviewers and the interviewees. Um, and all these interviews are the result of this encounter between survivors of the Holocaust and young people who grew up in today's Austria in this post-National Socialist Society of Austria, which is of course a very specific interview situation with specific outcomes. And among many other aspects of the listening to the first 10 of these interviews in detail, I noticed that all of the interviewees mention concrete places in the city of Vienna or in Austria, but mostly in Vienna during the testimonies. Oftentimes it's the address of their family homes, but also of friends and other relatives or the names of parks they used to play in or schools they went to. And of course, strongly influenced by the fact that I used to live in Vienna for a long time. I found it very fascinating to hear about these places in this often very concrete manner and to hear these very detailed memories of those places in the testimonies. And I would assume that the fact that um, the interviewees address these um, young people who uh, are from Austria, that that plays a certain role in, in this mentioning or, or referring to concrete places in Vienna and Austria during the testimonies. And to just give a very brief example, I want to show this quote from uh, an interview with Lucy Benedict, um, where at the very beginning of the interview, when she's asked about her earliest memories and about the apartment where she lived, she immediately mentions Hammerling Park, where she used to spend a lot of time as a kid. And she also recollects that she remembers the apartment uh, very well in detail. She mentions that it's in the Hochparterre, which means like a raised ground floor of a building. There was a large apartment with modern conveniences, a little balcony, and that it was also just next to a school in Albertgasse, um, the Albertgasse Gymnasium. Um, and that they would hear in the summertime, they would hear the students and the professors. In other interviews, um, there's also often short conversations between the interviewers and interviewees. They, um, the interviewers are asked if they know certain places. In one interview, for example, the interviewed person asks whether the interviewer still knows about this place where he always went ice skating as a child and whether it still exists. 
And then there is, of course, one place that is especially relevant in the testimonies about the kinder transports, and that's the train station of departure in Vienna, the so-called Westbahnhof, that also still exists and still is used uh, today. Um, for example, Frank P. Grad mentions it in his testimony. And um, after referring to, to the Westbahnhof and talking about the fact that he was on one of the first uh, kinder transports in December of 1938, um, that he distinctly remembers that at some point the lights in the train station went out and in this darkness the children um, were sort of split up in groups and, and had to board the train um, in, in the dark. Um, I now want to play a clip from another interview in which Anita Weisbord, who left Vienna on a kinder transport in March 39, um, also talks about the situation at uh, Westbahnhof, the Western train station, before the departure. Um, I'll play a clip, so please be prepared to maybe adapt um, the volume of your computer. Now, I'll never forget the day I left. We were on the railway station, the windows tightly closed, my mother outside, I'm inside the train. For five agonizing hours, the train stood there. My mother outside. I wish the train would leave already because I couldn't stand the tension, but I could not walk away from the window because I was afraid if I walk away, I'm going to be a loser forever. Well, that was over, well over 60 years ago. And to this day, I cannot stand anybody seeing me off. It left that impression on me. When I visited Vienna again for the first time after I had listened to these interviews and transcribed some of them, um, I noticed that I was especially moved when I happened to be in those places that the narrators had talked about. Very strikingly, of course, at the train station, but also in other places in the city. Like I would see the name of a street and, and remember the interview. And so at some point I, I started to just listen to an interview associated with the place on my phone while I was standing there. And that also reminded me of the fact that, and I think especially in academia, we often tend to just look at transcripts when we are working with oral history interviews and that somehow this power this, uh, of, of the oral source um, is lost um, by that. Um, of course, especially when we read quotes from oral history interviews in texts where it's not possible to just include a sound file. And therefore, I then decided that um, besides analyzing the interviews and the transcripts, I also wanted to try to make them accessible to a broader audience and to actually engage people in listening to the testimonies. And so I came up with an idea for a project that is more um, uh, a project of, of um, public history. And so now at the end of the presentation, I want to show you um, a short video that I did um, sort of as a result of those thoughts. Um, it includes a clip uh, from the interview with Laurie Siegel um, that she gave to the Austrian Heritage Collection in 2009. Um, I think uh, some or many of you might already know Laura Siegel. She's a writer who regularly publishes in The New Yorker. And among many other books, she has also written the novel Other People's Houses about her experiences on the kinder transport from Austria um, and her later life in England. And so uh, in this short video that I want to show at the end of the presentation, we will see the house uh, in Josef Stetter Straße, Josef, Josef Stetter Street number 81 in Vienna, where Laura Siegel and her family lived before they were forced to escape the city. Could you describe to me um the apartment that you lived in, in, in Josef Stetterstrasse? Uh, when I went back with my husband in 1968, 
I went up to and I rang the doorbell. And I got very excited to rem because of what I remembered, I realized what we remember, and I want you to check this out with yourself, of an apartment is its geography. Which room is where and which room is behind what? It isn't so much the colors or the shapes, which is what we think we remember. But what we really remember, what really is exciting, is to think that when the door opens, the little little toilet will be over here, the kitchen will be over here, the maid's room was, is a miserable little, little sausage-shaped room over there in front of here. Here's the gas castle, and over here is the hand simmer. Next to the hand simmer is the living room. Oh, is the bed? Is the is the dining room? But in the dining room is my mother's piano, and there's the the uh, the credence, and then over here is my parents' bedroom. And here is the um, uh, bathroom. And I got terribly excited, emotionally moved to remember how the rooms are related to each other geographically. And so I rang the bell and the, somebody, you could hear the slurping, you know, slippers like I'm wearing now, slip, slip, coming towards the door and somebody opened the door but put the chain on the inside, and somebody said, Ja, was wollen Sie? And I asked for my father, who had long been dead. I asked for Herr Grossman. And she says, no, we like that. And closed the door. That's my, that's my apartment. Thank you very much. Um, and maybe at this point also, once again, uh, thanks to Susan and Amy for organizing the wonderful uh, study group over the course of the past two years. Thank you. That was so wonderful. And I wanna thank all of our presenters, not only with presentations really beautiful and very moving, but everybody kept to time so well. I don't think I've ever seen anybody stick to time on a panel so well. A lot of the questions have been answered by people, you know, during the course of the presentations. So the ones that we have left, if people want to enter questions now, we have some time, I hope that we can take. Um, I think Ramona's question, this first question was for you, Natalia, why if families took these children in during the war, did they go to orphanages after the war? This is a great question. Um, and really it was my way of, um, uh, winging that there is a whole other universe to discuss but uh, but just on one foot uh, these are very complex stories and not all of those um, people who took care of Jewish children uh, some of whom were non-Jews some of whom as I mentioned uh, in I'm actually finding a lot of cases in which these non-Jews were intimately involved uh, with um, Jewish partners. Uh, so there was a, sort of an additional pre-existing emotional involvement, but uh, um, some of them uh, um, continue um, caring for these children and adopt them. Uh, some of them uh, see the, their role as uh, temporary, um, uh, temporary caretakers, uh, um, not see themselves as new parents. And then there is also an organized effort of uh, a Jewish community, uh, especially in Poland, to, um, to locate and recover, uh, recover Jewish uh, uh, survivor uh, children, uh, not only because some of them do have relatives, uh, and Josh just, just told us of one such story, right? There is a there is an aunt in uh, California, there is an uncle in uh, mandatory Palestine, uh, but also sort of to recover them for the Jewish nation. Uh, so um, some of these uh, people are paid uh, for their trouble, some of these children are handed over vol voluntarily, some of them are uh, kidnapped. Uh, and these are very complex stories of readjusting uh, of these children. This is something that uh, Jana Michlitz has uh, uh, published uh, uh, extensively on the, the complex trajectories of these children, some of whom actually mourn the parents who took 
care of them who are not their biological families who took care of them during the the war and think of that childhood as good and then very different stories as well but but it's a it's a microcosm of survival strategies and communal strategies after the war thank you for a great question we have a, a long one here let's see maybe i'm not sure who's going to want to answer this but maybe multiple people how should we think of the differences between orphans from families before the war, those who were orphaned under the more or less normal circumstances of daily life, which admittedly included orphans from World War I and pogroms, and orphans from the period of the Holocaust and the war? Is there anything we can learn from such a comparison? If not from a comparison of the orphans, perhaps from a comparison of the Jewish and other social services available. I'll just, uh, thank you, Sean. And I'll just say two words because I was actually thinking about it as I was preparing for this presentation that, uh, and, and it's easy for me to think about it because of the region uh, that I'm writing about, Eastern Galicia, there's a wave of uh, terrible uh, anti-Jewish violence at the end, towards the end of World War I, uh, with, uh, with uh, dozens and dozens of brutal pogroms. Um, and there are hundreds, if not thousands of, uh, of orphans. Uh, and so it's interesting to see that in a way, what Jewish community broadly does after the Holocaust really mirrors what was done uh, after these pogroms. It is uh, um, locating these children. There is less of an issue of Christian, uh, Christians raising them, but locating these children, providing for, for these children in orphanages, and ideally finding them adoptive parents abroad, uh, uh, you know, offering them a chance of better life abroad. And I've seen a few pictures in the JDC archives of, you know, of groups of pogrom children being on their way to a good life in, in America. And, there is obviously a book to be written there if uh, if these stories can be traced. Uh, but but it's a great question and a great question to really think of also about France and about Germany and about other uh, areas um, that people study. Yeah, I was thinking about Emily's presentation because Emily, you know, I think all of the presentations that we've had in the group have pointed out how fluid the term orphan can be. You know, if you lose a parent and the other parent can't take care of you, you can be classified as an orphan. It just depends on the place and the circumstance. But Emily, you were saying that the, the age was, the cutoff was 16. <laughs> they were going to come over, but that's so arbitrary. It changed after the war, you know? And in each country, the idea of what majority is, yeah. is different and what the consequences of majority is, is different. But the belief in the United States was they didn't want too many people to come over, not only because of anti-Semitism, but because there was a Great Depression going on and they didn't want people to take jobs and 16, up, oh, they might take our jobs. And uh, I do want to add that the idea of how orphans should be cared for is also different. The children coming to the United States struggled with whether they should go into stay all together because they lived institutionally in France and they liked it, or should they be spread out? And the United States was changing in its idea of what an orphanage should be like at that time. And one of the promises that was made by the U.S. come to England originally was we will put children all in homes of the same faith. In England, when children were brought in the kinder transport, they were put into any home that would, was willing to take them. And there were issues in England with kids being sexually abused and proselytized to. In the United States, there was a fair amount of moving kids from home to home because there were not the best matches. They were still working out how to house these children. Now, with the kids coming in from the United States, the um, Homeland Security will, or, or the housing groups will put children in homes if they can with their families, but often we're running into issues where it becomes the lawyer or the journalists that are supporting these children for safety purposes because they're being put wherever they're willing to be taken. And sometimes it's into the same hands as 
the smugglers who brought them over. And so we still need to work on protecting children. Natalia. I actually have a question to Emily, to Emily, if you can just follow up on this fascinating work that takes us to you know, lived experience now. And this also has to do with comparison. Is there any effort to document um, the experience of these children, the way that um, survivor uh, children testimonies were recorded right after the Holocaust? Fascinating question. Right now, it's very hard to get to the children. And very few journalists even are allowed into the detention centers. Once they end up in their families, there's still a lot of fear. There's a lot of fear of legality, green cards being taken away if people say too much. There's still fear of ICE. People are still in a post-traumatic situation from the past few years. However, there are groups that are I'm particularly interested in Guatemala. There are groups that are doing oral histories with people from Guatemala. The Shoah Foundation just did a whole group of ones from people post their genocide. And there are people who are researching what they can with the kids now. But there's no current lie that I know of live huge documentation process going on. And it is there's a lot of security and safety involved with children who are currently needing the help. Yeah, I'm thinking of that amazing clip that Kat played. You feel like there will be that material in 20 or 30 years that we'll be listening to, you know, from, from this recent, um, you know, experience of being an orphan on a border, but it just, it just seems, seems so striking somehow what's going on. I want to get a chance for Amy to have her question addressed. Uh, these presentations were so amazing. They really were. <laughs> as amazing as each of the wonderful scholars, I'm curious about how the scholars working groups focus, i.e. the use of the orphan slash orphanhood frame, helped or hindered your work on these larger projects. Who can speak to that? Um, it, it gave me a new lens, a different lens to think about the project. Instead of just looking at a, a memoir and sort of second generation story, it made me really start to focus in on Rachel as a, she's, I mean, after 1942, she's on her own. Um, and what it means for what the, her, her understanding, right? And what sort of lenses she's using to sort of think about her own experience. Um, and one of the questions that I, I grapple with is that when she's in, um, when she's with her uncle's family, um, so her maternal uncle's family um, in the, um, uh, the, the swamp, you know, he has his wife, three of his own kids, yet she, he takes her in and, and some others. So how do you, how is, how are people choosing to provide sort of scarce resources to some, I mean, she, she is a blood, like sort of a blood relative, but how, how are you divvying up resources amongst family members who aren't from the same household? Um, and this whole notion of it makes me think about the, certainly the second generation with her mother or her, her daughter Zipporah, Zippy, um, this notion of they not growing up with a family, right? And that, that survivors of their family members um, there's lots of other things in their testimony of both of them, of people that they sort of adopt into their family as they're going through people that they meet through school. Uh, one of um, Zippy's classmates is, um, is for all intents and purposes, an, an orphan in Israel. Uh, and as he goes through his IDF service, his, his national service, any break he has, he spends time at their house. And so there's this whole this whole layer of things that I started to think about be, uh, uh, by being a part of the group. Yeah, Natalia, please. Um, I, I think it was a wonderful group also because we we discovered uh, how much we share, uh, despite. Um, disciplinary differences. And, um, you know, for me as a, as a social historian, listening to uh, presentations and discussing with people who had a lens from literary studies and, and social work and performance, it really made me ask questions that I think I wouldn't ask, but they were there in the material. They just helped me 
see the potential of, of these incredible uh, sources and, and life experiences. Um, so uh, yeah, this was, this was wonderful. I can't believe it's over. Um, thank you, Susan, again. Yeah, I think the interdisciplinary nature of it was really something very special. That might kind of feed into a question for Kat, you know, about what you're going, what you plan to do. This is, I think <clears throat> everyone is so blown away by that work that you showed. Um, what kind of project are you envisioning with the interview film combo? Would this be something like an app for people interested in the subject for walking around Vienna? Do similar projects already exist in Vienna or Europe in general? Connecting it physically to a place is just so powerful. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, that was also really the experience that prompted me to think in that direction in the first place. Um, I think the app is a, it's a really good idea. I did some sketching of uh, online mapping, sort of placing excerpts, transcripts of excerpts on a, on a map of Vienna. And uh, yeah, I think that that would be a wonderful idea. At this point, I'm still trying to figure it out. Um, because I, I'm also trying to wonder how much the videos actually distract from the testimony or, you know, how much, what it actually does to the testimony. Um, but yeah, I think one ideal version uh, in my head would be that really people who are in Vienna actually listen to the testimonies in the places and at the same time that people who are not in Vienna could have sort of a similar experience online, for example. And I'm going to mispronounce this, but I was thinking of the project with the Stolperstein. Is that what they're called? Yeah, Stolperstein, yeah. yeah. Thank you, if you say it much better. But you know, this is very powerful when you're in a particular place and there's this suggestion of a sort of, you know, hidden complex, you know, history. But I think what you would be able to provide through those kinds of materials would be even, even more detailed and less abstract somehow. Yeah, and in a, in a way trying to make this history visible, especially, for example, in Vienna, where, you know, this history is not very visible in a lot of places. Let me, um, let me ask this one. Has there been any research done on the children that were orphaned but still had parents um, alive who survived the Holocaust? Were there any ways for parents who survived to find their children? And were the ones who were put into Christian homes ever told of their Jewish ancestry? Do you know of any reunions after the war? This is huge because there's a huge literature about cases like this. Yeah, who wants to start? Um, Josh, do you wanna start? Yeah, I mean, I think two of the most well-known cases is in terms of how you kept records was Irina Sendler keeping records of the students um, or of, the, of the, some of the kids that she got out of the Warsaw Ghetto. Um, and then in Paris, Suzanne Spock, um, who worked with getting, getting French Jewish kids out of uh, the OSC orphanages um, as they were being places of deportation, she kept records as well. Um, but it's, it's unclear how much that actually worked as at the end of, of reuniting families. Unro was doing some of that work too, trying to sort of forcibly, you know, repatriate children. But Natalia, please. Um, oops, uh, no. sorry, this is, uh, I'm in Germany and uh, it's automatically <laughs> turning off, uh, telling me to go home. Uh, but um, this is primarily a Jewish institutional effort. Uh, there, a, a communal organization was set up that was uh, working underground with a sort of knowledge of the authorities in which uh, interestingly people of very different political um, views and ideological affiliations co collaborated. So it's it's really kind of a know-how uh, of uh, collecting um, snippets of information, so-and-so heard that so-and-so uh, left the child with so-and-so and then going to those villages and uh, sitting with uh, people in an inn and listening to, again, rumors that there is a child that is uh, tending to cows in the next village that is really a Jew. Uh, and then uh, people who took in Jewish children would also write to Jewish committees that they have a Jewish child and they would like to uh, receive a certain amount of money to return it. Uh, I mean, it's it's time of tremendous uh, upheaval of poverty uh, 
uh, and people do see it. Some some of these people see it as a possibility to um, to get started, and and also some of them genuinely believe that the child be, belongs with the with the Jewish community. However, uh, even today, there are still stories, and there are some of those famous stories uh, of people who found out. Uh, very late in life that uh, their mothers, that their fathers were not their biological mothers and fathers. There's a famous case of uh, a former priest uh, who uh, took on symbolically inscribed into his ID, both the name of uh, the names of his Jewish parents and the names of the parents who saved him, his original Jewish last name and the last name that was his life, last name all his life until he found out because he was taken in as a as a baby, uh, simply at the age of a few weeks. So he had no memory of his other identity. Um, but yes, a, a wonderful question. And there are stories and documentaries and, and books um, to, to follow this. Yeah, I think there's an organization in Poland, isn't there, for people who find out that they have Jewish, um, you know, roots. But Emily, you were going to say something too, weren't you? I was going to say two kind of opposite things. Most of the children who came to the United States ended up not finding out until after the war what had happened to their parents. And many of them were first reunited with one another, and that was the feeling of family which they ended up having. But I was thinking of um, after the war, there were hidden children in France as well. And one of the men who I interviewed, he happened to be my first French teacher, and I didn't know that he was a survivor until after. But I interviewed him and he was a hidden child. He went home to his house in Paris after the war was over, brought by a person from the Red Cross. The Red Cross did a lot of trying to help people reunite after the war. And just by chance, his mother was had just recently been released and made her way back home. And it could be a beautiful, happy, happy reunion. But she was so traumatized that she needed time before she could be a parent again. And with him, he actually ended up going to the Ose, which still existed, and living in one of their orphanages which eventually is what took him to the United States. And then he brought his mother over. And I gather from what I've read that this is not a unique instance. There were many parents who were able to parent after, but there were many who did need time. And these organizations did need to work in a post-traumatic stress disorder kind of role also as the world was resettling. Did you come across any stories of reunions? Were there, you know, children in the kinder transport who later were reunited with their parents? Uh, yes. And um, I mean, I don't have the statistics now, but I think that there is a tendency that more um, survivors who were reunited with their parents tend to give oral histories, which is, yeah interesting that is interesting to think about one of the other things along this and in, in the work i found was that in israel growing up so zip you remember every every night at 6 p.m they would turn on the radio and there was a radio program of you could call in and they would read out that you know so and so is looking for their uncle who was from baranovich or from wuj and you could that was one of the ways in which they were trying in israel to find relatives if, if they had made it to, to Israel. Yeah, and people were carefully watching ship manifests and things like that and trying to identify survivors. And, um, and the lists that were made by Abraham Klausner, you know, after the war, they were, it was, a mu it was a much more challenging thing. And then also for children who were so young, you know, you can understand why with babies. You know, we have to end soon, but Natalia, you had mentioned, you know, the man who adopted the child after the war and, uh, I was just wondering if you would even need to do that in the chaos after the war. How would someone know that a child who you were with was not your child? You know, of course, of course. You, this this was a this was for the purpose of uh, stealing a half a minute to explain it. But uh, all of these um, legal acts were really done without legal procedures, meaning 
someone became uh, your child, uh, the same way as plenty of people um, in my research that emerge from, from hiding and in the process uh, become um, emotionally involved, uh, they simply announce themselves to be married. Uh, I don't think that there is, a, um, there is much of a, a paperwork for their of their marriage uh, either. Uh, so there is a great degree of um, um, gray zone in this post-war period in establishing one's identity, like Josh mentioned, one's age, uh, taking on a, a name. Um, and so I think this is part of the um, uh, nervous efforts of, of Jewish institutional frameworks to sort of recover these children when they still can. Um, and and I, I'm, I'm hesitating using the word recover because it's obviously putting a certain um, uh, um, emotional tone to what they perceived as a, as a national uh, duty. Uh, but, um, but yeah, I wanted to add to this ambivalence that on the one hand, um, there are children who in their testimonies uh, years later, uh, celebrate the fact that they were recovered, that they found themselves, that they were found and that they found themselves, but this is not always uh, the case. Um, and I, I recall a documentary about a woman who was uh, saved in an orphanage uh, that was run by nuns that sort of remained deeply, deeply emotionally longing for, for that experience. And actually in the film, she goes back to that monastery and, and she kind of comes home as in uh, uh, um, the, the story we heard about coming home that Katarina presented that was so moving. By the way, I thought it was incredibly interesting that this geographic space of the apartment is what emerges as one sort of emotional mapping of childhood. I think that making Thank the you. past real too must be very powerful. And Josh, that story of the um, the woman hearing German, you know, and having that incredibly emotional response. Yeah. Well, I, I think the presentations were just beautiful. We're really grateful to everyone for sharing um, their scholarship for doing such a wonderful job. Yes, thank you so much. And I just want to mention that somebody had asked for Natalia's reading list that she mentioned, and I can include that in the email I'm going to send to everybody. Uh, when I send the link to the video, I will include Natalia's uh, reading. I think I think we should we we could all uh, pitch in a few of the important readings in our research so that so that uh, everybody can get a sense of what they might read over the summer. <laughs> Little light reading over the summer, but no, please do send your suggestions to me and I'll, and I'll forward them to everybody. So on behalf of the center, thank you so much. This was really very fascinating. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye.